Welcome to Gateway Sermons, and thank you for joining us as we venture together through God's Word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we love you so much. It's you that loved us. It's you that is the reason we have this day for us to celebrate, Lord. We praise you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to be born as a human being, a human man, to break this curse, Lord God, to give life, to save, to heal, to love, to reign. We give you thanksgiving, Father, honor and glory and praise for who you are and for what you've done in designing and then accomplishing this work of redemption through Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would watch over our hearts and our minds this morning. Lord, allow us to listen. Lord, please be with me. Fill me with your spirit that I might speak in a way that glorifies you with clarity and precision and humility and kindness, Lord, that your word would be heard clearly and I would not be in the way. I pray that everyone would hear from the youngest to the oldest the glory of Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished. This we ask through his name. Amen. Early in the year 1865, Robert Todd Lincoln, who was Abraham Lincoln's son, was traveling by train from New York to Washington. He was taking a break from his studies at Harvard. And uh, the train stopped in Jersey City, New Jersey, and he hopped off for a minute, but he noticed that the platform was too crowded for him to stand anywhere, so he backed up against a train or one of the train cars and he leaned his back against it, and, which was fine to let everybody pass, but then the train moved. And when it moved, it whipped him around and he dropped down into the place between the platform and the train, which is not a very safe place at all to be. But thankfully, there was a guy there that saw him fall down, reached down, grabbed him by the collar and actually yanked him back up onto the platform and saved his life at most, but saved him from serious injury probably. We're, Can't say for sure, but when Robert Todd Lincoln looked up to see who it was that had saved his life, he was astonished. He was amazed. It was one of the most famous actors in theater at that time, a man named Edwin Booth. It would be like, um, who's a famous actor now? Uh, Like like Tom Hanks or something, pulling you out of the way of a moving car or something like that. It was just, it was an amazing moment for him. Edwin Booth didn't even know that the person he had saved was Abraham Lincoln's son until several months later when he got a letter thanking him for saving Robert Todd Lincoln, which was around the same time that Edwin Booth's brother, John Wilkes Booth, shot and murdered the 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. The Lincoln family was saved by one Booth and killed by another. Our text this morning, we're in Romans 5 on this last Sunday of Advent, tells us the story of two Adams. We are killed by one, saved by another. And the baby born in the manger we've come to celebrate this morning is the most important person who ever lived. We began four Sundays ago and we talked about our need for rescue. Then we talked about the promise of rescue. Then we looked at its fulfillment in God's provision of rescue. And this morning, the fourth and last Sunday of Advent, Christmas Eve this year, I want to talk about the perfection of this rescue. To close everything down, to bring all these threads together. I heard one preacher summarize Romans 5 like this. He said that what Jesus accomplished for all those that are in Him is far greater than what Adam accomplished for all those that are in him. So we look to Romans 5. I want to map out where we're headed this morning, just so you know as we head in, because this is a longer text, and I, it, Paul is in some deep water here. He's talking about the structure of salvation. He gets very specific here. It's beautiful. I'm not going to take a fine-tooth comb to the text this morning, although we could every single sentence here, seriously, every single sentence just begs for exposition. It begs for explanation. It's such a beautiful section. When one of my favorite preachers I was talking about last week, when John Piper preached through Romans to his church, it took him eight years. Eight years to preach through Romans. So now now you can understand if it takes me a year or so to get through a book, it, it could be worse. It's not that bad. But the amazing thing was is that he spent, this is one of the reasons why it took eight years, he spent 
five sermons on one paragraph in Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. And that might sound like, oh my gosh, that'd be so tedious, but you could do that. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Now, he preached at that church for 20 years before he started Romans, so he had earned their attention. But it's Christmas Eve. We are in an ocean this morning in this text, but no deep sea fishing, I promise. I will not put you through that. I'm going to try to work through this fairly quickly. My goal is just to highlight the main theme of Paul's argument here because of how it ties so beautifully to Advent and everything we've been talking about. The main theme of the whole letter of Romans, particularly from 117 onward, has been this thing, this doctrine of justification by faith apart from works, which is kind of a fancy way of saying that believers in Jesus are not declared righteous by God because of their own good works or their own goodness, but because of Jesus' righteousness, which can only be received by faith alone. And so Paul is explaining all of that in chapter 5 in a very unique way. He does it by showing the similarities and the differences there are between Adam and Jesus Christ. This gets right to the heart of Advent, of what even got us into this predicament in the first place and what is sufficient enough to get us out. So let's take about maybe 20 minutes or so and walk through this text and then we'll talk about it a little bit and we'll be done. We'll begin at verse 1 of chapter 5. Paul says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Isn't that interesting? Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, Will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. So we want to set this up because the the, the point, the bulk of this argument is in the second half of Romans 5. But what Paul is doing here, he's rejoicing because those who believe like him, they have peace with God. Remember, the Bible started out with the fracture of that peace, but now peace with God has been regained, a peace that holds them up, believers up in the difficulties of life in this world, not because of their own effort or works or goodness, but because God has declared them righteous just for believing in Jesus Christ for their salvation, just for receiving His grace, his love for them is so deep, in fact, that he died for them. Jesus died for them while they were still sinners. Now, that's a verse that almost everybody knows, if you know the Bible at all. But tease it out and understand precisely what is being said here because it's beautiful. For God proved his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still lying, while we were still cheating, while the drug addict had the needle in his vein, while the alcoholic was taking another drink, while the adulterer was cheating, Christ died for us. Christ died for us while we were like that. While we were still rebels, before we showed any fruit, before there was any potential, Rather than looking at the evidence of people's lives and deciding whether or not they were worthy, he declares them righteous and reconciles them to himself based completely on the life of Jesus Christ. 
because we have faith in him. Now, as you read that, this is what I think Paul is doing here. The question could arise in your mind. You could be thinking, why is all that necessary? Right? I've, I've never openly rebelled against God. You say Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, that's fine, but I never have. I wasn't there. Why do we need salvation? Why, why, why is the manger necessary? Why have we written songs about this? Why do we talk about this? Why is it so important? Why do we need grace? You might be saying, have I really done so many bad things in my life that to save me, the Son of God had to come, become a human being, and be crucified for me? Am I that bad? Is my record that bad? I think that Paul's argument here is absolutely crucial to our understanding of God because those are great and fair questions. I think Paul pulls all the way back here to help us understand where guilt comes from so that the message of being made right with God based on His grace and not our works appears as beautifully as it's meant to to our hearts by showing us just how superior Jesus really is to Adam. So let's look at 12 through 21. Because verse 12 is interesting. Just real quick, at the end of verse 12, in most translations, you'll see a big dash there. And then verse 13 just picks up another sentence. It's like Paul started to continue in verse 12, and then he stopped and thought, I need to make this really clear. So this is a beautiful text. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin... So try to follow him here. In this way, death spread to all people because all sinned. Now, there's, again, there's a dash there. So he meant to say he's, he's picking up something or clarifying something. In fact, verse 13, sin was in the world before the law. But sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned. So even when sins weren't being counted, death still reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is a type of the coming one. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if by the one man's trespass the many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift which comes through the grace of the one man Jesus Christ overflowed to the many? And the gift is not like the one man's sin. Because from one sin came the judgment resulting in condemnation, but from many trespasses came the gift, resulting in justification. Since by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So then, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone... So also through one righteous act, and I think he means there the entire life and death of Jesus Christ, there is justification leading to life for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The law came along to multiply the trespass. But where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. Just real quick, that means you cannot out-sin grace. You can't do it. It's a scandalous thing that at the rate at which my sin increases, grace is increasing faster. That's a beautifully amazing thing. But where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more so that, so here's why, Grace multiplies at a faster rate than sin. Just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, Paul reveals that by God our Creator's reckoning. So this is to answer that question that might arise. Paul reveals that by God our Creator's reckoning, all human beings, all of us, without exception, sinned when Adam sinned way back in the garden. We were in him, the head of humanity. 
and incurred the exact same condemnation, therefore, that Adam did. Which is why everyone, even babies, who had never committed any acts of sin, has been dying since Adam and Eve first fell and were thrown out of the garden. Human beings are not then, this is huge, human beings are not then guilty before God first and foremost because of the things they do, because of the individual sins they commit. That's why people died even before God gave the law to Moses. You see what Paul is saying. Look, people kept dying even though they weren't doing the same thing Adam did. They didn't hear a command. They didn't know they were supposed to do this and not supposed to do that. So they weren't sinning, but they kept dying. After Adam and before the law, all people continued to suffer the penalty of the curse of death. All people are guilty before God, not mainly because then, if that's true, they knowingly break God's rules, but because all human beings are descendants of Adam. It's because of that that no matter what we do, we remain under God's wrath. We end up sinning, of course, because of our nature, because we are connected to Adam who disobeyed God. And it is at this point in Paul's argument when Paul reveals Adam in verse 14 as that head, as that representative of all of humanity, it's there he reveals that Adam is a type of Christ. It's a weird place to put the end of verse 14, that sentence. Where did that come from? What's the point of it? A type in the Bible is something or someone that foreshadows something or someone in the future and is both like what it foreshadows, but unlike what it foreshadows. Beloved, this is everything for our souls. How Adam and Jesus are the same and how Adam and Jesus are different. We need to know desperately, everybody in this room, that we're not first guilty before God because of what we do. right? That we end up being connected to Adam because we do wrong things too. And so then we show, well, yeah, so now I'm connected to Adam. Why is this so important? Why would this matter? Why is Paul laboring this idea? If you hear nothing else that I say this morning, hear this sentence. Here's why this is such a big deal and such a beautiful thing for Christmas. Here's why he's arguing. Because if we think that our behavior is what gets us condemned, we are also going to think that it's our behavior that gets us condemned justified. And Paul desperately wants his readers to know that your behavior is not what gets you justified before God. So he's explaining that God reckons all people guilty by their nature. The minute they're conceived, guilty. Death is coming. They're all in Adam. It's not because of what they do. What we do is evidence of our nature. It is not the creator of it. We sin because we're sinners. You see how the gospel works no matter where you are, no matter what nation, no matter who you're talking to. It doesn't matter how bad people have been or how kind of good they have been. Everybody comes from Adam and so everybody is guilty. Paul wants us to understand that God does not declare us righteous because of specific acts of goodness that we do. That's not how we're made righteous with God. But because by grace, through faith, those who believe are in Christ. Just like Adam's disobedient nature is placed in all of us when we're conceived, Christ's perfectly obedient nature is given to us the moment we believe and we are born again into a new humanity, into a new race. God declares us forgiven by his blood and declares us righteous because that blood is the blood of a perfectly obedient Savior. We get that DNA when we are saved. We get what Jesus is in salvation. Adam was the head of a humanity. That's what he was. Of every human being that has ever lived, 
that has ever and will ever exist and the curse that God laid on him for his disobedience passes to every human being that has ever and will ever exist, causing them also to sin against God, the result of which is death for them, just like it was for Adam. But Adam, as that, as the head, that everybody after him gets something, is a type of Jesus Christ, who is also the head of a humanity, but one in which that curse has been broken. Because Jesus as a second Adam then. That, that, that's, that's Jesus out there in the wilderness for us in Luke chapter 4. The serpent tempting him. Trying to pull him away. Using God's word to get him to doubt God's word. But Jesus doesn't give in. He doesn't sin. He doesn't fall. And all his life he never falls. And because as a second Adam then. He obeyed his whole life and never sinned, never committed any unrighteousness, and then offered that perfect life up as a sacrifice to God, as payment for the sins of all the people he was going to redeem. God is going to accomplish his purpose in creating humanity and have a people who will worship him forever because he's poured out his grace on them. Jesus comes and fulfills and enables the design God had in creating this world. Jesus Christ is so much better than Adam. And Paul says in verse 16 that you can't even compare this gift. That's what it is. That's a gift. Tomorrow morning we will give gifts. We don't give gifts, hopefully not, because whether, based on whether or not people have earned them, but because we love them. And we like to see them smile. And we like to see them happy. And that's a beautiful echo in all of us of who God is and what God has done for us. But Paul says there in verse 16, you can't even compare the gift of God in Jesus and what it accomplishes with the result of one man's sin. Even though it completely wrecked humanity, you can't compare the two. Judgment followed one sin, Paul says, and after one sin, disobedient act brought condemnation. But Jesus, he says, followed many sins and still brought justification. So Paul explains that the obedience of Jesus on our behalf is the only remedy that exists for the damage done by the disobedience of Adam. Jesus Christ is the only remedy, the only hope we have is an alien righteousness accomplished by somebody else, given to us that saves us. That's the only hope mankind has to be saved. And there is no other remedy. There is no other way of salvation. Paul is saying, look, the main reason death reigned over us is not because we did wrong things, but because we are connected to Adam. And the main reason, therefore, eternal life now reigns for all who believe is not because we did good things, but because those who believe have the righteousness of Jesus imputed to them by grace through faith. Which means that God's divine rescue is a complete and perfect rescue that secures eternal life for all who believe in the promised Savior. Beloved, the perfection of God's rescue means that Jesus in salvation is not getting us back into a garden-type predicament where our destiny hangs in the balance based on the decisions we make, based on whether we do what is right or what is wrong. It's not what Jesus accomplished to get us this far and then from here on out, it's up to us to get it right. Christmas doesn't mean anything, anything, if all Jesus did was get us back into another garden in front of another tree with the serpent still hiding in the shadows. Another test to see if we hold out. No, no, no. He crushed the snake's head. He accomplished salvation. God's rescue is a perfect rescue. 
It transfers us through faith in His Son to this incorruptible state secured for us by a perfect second Adam that cannot be undone. The result is eternal life, not the potential for it. That's not what we have in salvation. The work of Jesus wholly justifies, wholly saves, paradise is regained, and there are no ifs. So the question before all of us this morning is, have you received this grace? Have you received this grace? The free gift is not like the trespass. Paul is saying that. Paul uses the word everyone, and then he qualifies it by saying those who receive this grace. That's the everyone he's talking about. But maybe, maybe what it is, and I understand this, Absolutely, I understand this. Maybe what keeps somebody from believing in Jesus Christ, from receiving salvation, is that they think, look, I, I can't do that. There's no way I can live the kind of life that being a Christian seems to require. I, I don't have it in me. You don't know what I am. You don't know how messed up I am. I can't live that life. I can't behave that long. I can't behave that well. I just want you to know, if you're thinking the reason you resist is that I could never be righteous enough for God to accept me, I want you to know that you believe that because the serpent is still telling lies. He's still lying to us. He's still doing the same thing. Did God actually say that you could be totally forgiven without paying for it? Did, did he really say that you would be made completely righteous because you believe in Jesus? Like that's all you have to do? Just believe? What, what a dump. If, 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 if a terrorist right at the last minute asks God for forgiveness and all the junk they've done in their life and they just get forgiven and saved and let in, come on. That's not true. He is a liar and the father of lies. And he has been lying and murdering from the beginning. This is the word of God. This is how God says he will save. This is how God says he will make right. Throw yourself onto Jesus. Receive this indescribable gift. And the moment you do, the moment you do, you are completely justified before God. You are perfectly righteous in Christ forever. God's wrath is completely removed from over your head and He will be totally for you forever. And no one and nothing can snatch you out of His hand. Christian, believer, are you weary this morning? Are you weary in life from trying so hard to get this thing right? To do what the Bible calls us to do, to listen and to obey these commands? Are you weary? Are you tired? Remember, no matter how well you behave or how poorly you behave, it will always only ever be the righteousness of Jesus Christ that makes us acceptable to God. Nothing else. You could never mess up for the rest of your life and live 80 million more years. When you get to heaven, do you know whose righteousness is credited to your account? His. That's the perfection of this rescue, of God's rescue through His Son, for all who just believe. Who just believe Jesus. The Bible began in a garden. We fell. Do you remember that's where we started four Sundays ago and God blocked in Genesis 3, He blocked the way back to the tree of life. They can't come back. They're not going to find it. I'm going to block it from them. 
You know how the Bible ends? Can I read this to you in closing? Revelation 22, 1 through 5. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations. And there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will give them the light. And they will reign forever and ever. We begin in a garden. And for all who believe, we'll end in a new one. And all of this becomes true because of Jesus Christ. Merry Christmas to you. Let's pray. And the band will come. Our ushers will come. Let's pray. Our Father, what words are there to express our thanks, our joy for what you have done? The world is so dark and so twisted and so many places, Lord. But the light has come. The light has come into this place this morning, Lord. There's not a corner of any life in this room where your light cannot break through and shine and save and give life and give meaning and give hope and give peace. It's what you do. That's what your invasion into our world was. So we praise you this Christmas. We praise you for what you've done for us. And Father, as the recipients of unmerited grace, we plead with anyone in this room that doesn't know you to come and join us around the throne, unworthy, sinners all made righteous by Jesus. There's a place for everybody around the throne, Father. Will you bring them this morning? Will you draw them? Will you fix our eyes on Jesus Christ this year? Thank you so much for this time we've had. Thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do through the offering that's about to be taken. Thank you, Lord, for our band, for the singers, for the creative wisdom that goes into all of that. I thank you so much, Lord God. Thank you for this church. I praise you for it. I praise you, Lord, for what you're doing here. I thank you so much, Lord God. Would you bless every family, every person in the coming days. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our perfect, obedient Savior. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. And if you have any questions about today's recording, Gateway Church, or what it means to follow Jesus Christ, you can reach us through the contact section of our website, gwbrawley.org.